Missile defense. Here you can see a Royal Aircraft, what looks like a Spitfire, or possibly a Typhoon, intercepting a German V-1 missile in the air, and the typical tactic was to tip the wing, and then the V-1 would spin and fall into the ground, hopefully on a farmer's field. The velocities are are listed on the left, and these are of incoming missiles. A short-range ballistic missile of zero to 600 kilometers an hour will come in at one to two kilometers a second, which is remarkably fast. A medium-range ballistic missile at three to four kilometers a second, an IRBM at uh, four to five kilometers a second, and an ICBM at seven to eight kilometers a second. Now, boost phase is higher than mid-course altitude for short-range ballistic missiles and medium-range ballistic missiles. Boost phase is when you're taking off and you have a hot plume of propellant and you're moving slowly and you're very visible. Mid-course is typically, uh, if you're in, in the atmosphere, you can be visibly seen. If you go into space, then you're able to go at uh, remarkable speeds because there's much less friction. Also in space, if you've ever seen the video of an astronaut dropping a hammer and a feather, uh, because you're in vacuum, there's no difference in, in the speed of a heavy object and a light object. So if you were to inflate a balloon that looked like a warhead, it would look identical to a real warhead. And that's what decoys are. And so decoys in space could end up wasting interceptors. The key here is that the speeds are enormous uh, and it requires a lot of computing power to be able to shoot these incoming missiles down. Now the Soviets around Moscow, they use nuclear warheads for interception, but hit to kill technology, which is currently being used by the US and China, basically uh, uses a, a rocket to actually physically contact an incoming um, um, rocket. The Patriots during the 1991 war against Iraq, they were fragmentation. So they would go up and hit a scud, but it was found uh, very often it would simply split the scud into three or four pieces and the scud would continue on its ballistic path. It would just crash into the ground still with the warhead intact but it would crash in pieces. So let's take a look at missile defense. The earliest manifestation was in the form of bomber defense. Defense of the continental US consisted of nuclear armed interceptors and surface to air missiles SAMs, with nuclear warheads. These formed the organizational nucleus for defense against inbound ballistic missiles. There were 392 nuclear warhead Bomark missiles deployed at eight US and two Canadian sites, as well as Nike Ajax and Nike Hercules missiles. A US Bomark surface air missile, which you can see displayed here on the uh, extreme right, uh, between 1961 and 1972 had a 708 kilometer range. So these were deployed uh, when a Soviet bomber force was seen coming across the Canadian Arctic and they would then detonate a nuclear weapon and uh, uh, the sparsely populated Canadian uh, population up there would be less affected than if the interception were made farther south. There is a Bomark missile at the uh, Ottawa uh, Air and Space Museum. You can see at the bottom a U.S. ASALM, which is a nuclear air-to-air -air missile cruise missile concept. The Bomarks were deployed at North Bay and Lamakaza at two different sites. This is the North Bay site. This is the uh, Genie nuclear air-to-air -air missile that was uh, manufactured in 1957. This is a U.S. Uh, Air Force F-4 Phantom carrying a Genie air-to-air -air missile. This is a nuclear Falcon missile being launched from an F-102 Delta Dagger. You can see here a close-up of the Falcon nuclear air-to-air -air missile. This is a lineup of Falcon nuclear air-to-air -air missiles. And on the right, you can see a conventional Falcon air-to-air -air missile flying through a drone B-29 target aircraft. This is the NATO Nike Ajax system. You had system, one system like this deployed at every major city in the US. So there were over 200 sites. Here is another US Nike Ajax system. They were also deployed in Northern Italy, West Germany, other countries in Western Europe, as well as Turkey. This is a map of the deployment of the UK Bloodhound SAM system, which was very similar. 
The second phase was a focus on missile defense. The first programs were the Wizard and the Thumper programs. The U.S. Army started research in 1946, but it canceled it due to premature technologies. The U.S. Air Force continued research on land-based, space-based, and satellite-based interceptor systems into the 1950s. The October 1957 launch of Sputnik, the first satellite, by, uh, basically provoked sustained research funding. In 1958, the U.S. started work on a particle beam weapon. The first laser was invented in 1960, and the first chemical and carbon dioxide laser were developed in 1965. This was the U.S. Army 1958 wizard concept of an interceptor rocket. This is an early ground laser testbed vehicle, an LVTP-7, from the 1970s. These are imaginary space-based lasers that were thought of during the 1980s when uh, the U.S. government proposed the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is supposed to be an architecture of a space-based defense. It was very controversial, disliked by the uh, peace movement in the U.S., and it provoked great reaction from the Soviet Union, which retrospectively we know realized uh, they really were not at the stage ready to even compete. If you look at the bottom right, you've got the distinction there between the three courses of a missile. The boost phase, where they're uh, moving relatively slowly, the mid course, which could be exoatmospheric, and then the terminal phase, where the warhead is coming at enormous speed into the target. This is a early depiction of a ground-based laser. Generally, firing from the ground up, you're going to have severe distortion because of movements of air. So very often, uh, lasers have a smaller guiding laser before the big laser is turned on, and this, the smaller laser detects whether it's distorted optically, and then it applies a correction to the bigger laser to compensate for distortions in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is like a giant lens, but it's not a fine lens, it's, it's very distorting. Firing from space into the uh, Earth in the opposite direction would be even more difficult uh, because of the various gases which would distort, um, the, the just like they distort the, uh, the light from the sun going into the atmosphere. Uh, firing from space onto the ground could be called artillery, as in orbital artillery. This is a concept for a space-based laser projector from the U.S. Space Shuttle, uh, which would have made it easier to blow up satellites without actually having to go anywhere near them. The first missile defense system was proposed by the U.S. government in 1967. U.S. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara announced a light missile defense system against China, costing about $5 billion. It was for the protection of counter-value and counter-force targets. It was thought that China, which was uh, very radically communist and hostile, was uh, likely to act as a surrogate for the Soviet Union. It was not designed to defend against the Soviets because the U.S. didn't want an arms race. The Soviets, in any case, could have easily defeated a few interceptor missiles by creating a lot of decoys and by MIRVing, or multiple independently, independently targeted reentry vehicles, by putting multiple warheads in their missiles. It was a two-rocket system. It had a Spartan 5-megaton warhead and a Sprint shorter-range missile. Nixon cancelled it when he had his rapprochement with China in 1971. He needed China as an ally to counterbalance the Soviet Union. China and the Soviet Union had had a border clash in 1969, which killed at least a thousand soldiers. Now this was the early proposed range for the Sentinel program to protect the different cities in the United States. This is a U.S. Sprint anti-ballistic missile rocket. This would have been the shorter range of the two systems. You can see third from the right, the Spartan rocket next to the second from the right, which is the Sprint rocket, the short and the long range variants. The bow mark is on the extreme right. And then you can see the Ajax, and then the Nike Hercules in the second from the left, and of course the Zeus A. These were deployed in various parts of NATO, and they were high altitude, long range anti-ABM, anti-ballistic missiles, but they were primarily SAMs, surface air missiles. This is an inflatable Minuteman decoy. So a Minuteman uh, would deploy into space, it'd become exoatmospheric, it would deploy a number of these decoys and the Soviets would then waste their nuclear interceptors around Moscow trying to shoot down these bags of gas. This is a U.S. Sprint anti-ballistic missile Sentinel launch in 1967 in the Pacific. This is a U.S. 1965 Spartan launch. 
this particular rocket could go up to Mach 10. Uh, I don't have any visuals, but if you find a visual of a US ABM launching from the 60s, it's incredible how quickly they pick up speed. Yeah, if a human were inside it, they would die. So it's not a rocket that you can use to launch people into space. It's astounding how quickly they accelerated. The Spartan had a nuclear warhead. The third system was the safeguard system. In 1969, Nixon redesignated Sentinel into a point defense system, not to protect cities, but to protect the missile silo fields. This he termed safeguard. It used Spartan and Sprint rockets deployed to defend Minuteman silos. It was based at Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota. Spending on it was sustained by a 51 to 50 vote in the Senate and it was ultimately canceled after a single day of operation on July 1st, 1976, because Nixon judged it to be non-cost effective. Because of the partial test ban treaty against atmospheric testing, there was no occasion to fully test the system. So this is the US's first and only ABM site until the bases were established at Vandenberg Air Force Base and Fort Greeley uh, in California and Fort Greeley in Alaska. So this is the Stanley Mickelson Safeguard Base in Nakoma, North Dakota. This is the phased array radar of Safeguard under construction. This is the Soviet ABM system protecting Moscow. The Soviets set up six ground launcher bases with 64 Gazelle and 36 SH-11 Gorgon one megaton warhead interceptors plus S-400s farther out, all guided by a UHF band radars. Their mission was to complete an exoatmospheric intercept, in other words, to detonate a nuclear warhead against incoming missiles outside of the atmosphere, and they were able to intercept a small number of incoming warheads. Because the interceptors were, however, liquid-fueled, they were not deployed except in times of crisis. The Soviets, for theater missile defense today, have available, rather the Russians today, have 200 launchers with 1,900 S-300 missiles. That is a very large commitment. The S-300 is a very powerful anti-aircraft missile with very long range, but it also has anti-missile capability. Pictured here on the bottom left is the 15D, what NATO designates as the SA-2 surface to air missile, and it was nuclear capable. You have on the um, right the SA-5 Gammon, which is a Cold War interceptor and could be used for missile interception. So this is the ABM coverage from Ma Moscow in relationship to local geography. And you can see here the Soviet Galosh ABM. There were 36 nuclear-armed A-350 Galosh interceptors. Now they've been replaced. The Galosh is a NATO designation, not the Soviet name. This is the radar coverage that shows how the ABM system around Moscow was integrated into that system. This is the location of the ABM-1B complex and the ABM-3 Gazelle complex around Moscow. I tried and failed to see these locations when I was in Moscow in 1987. Here you can see the Galosh ABMs on transporters at the top and on the May Day Parade at the bottom. This is a picture of the Soviet Gazelle ABM launch site and it looks similar to the American Sprint short-range rocket. Now the problem of cruise missiles, they fly very low and so against the background foliage of trees and wires they're difficult to detect. The US never did develop a defense against low flying submarine launched cruise missiles, though it had set up coastal phased array radars to detect such a launch. The US's uh, F-14 Tomcat, depicted here, could fire a Phoenix missile, which you can also depict in the smaller frame, and this missile could track and destroy cruise missiles at sea particularly cruise missiles designed to destroy U.S. aircraft carriers and those with nuclear warheads. Between 1972 to June 13, 2002, the ABM Treaty was in effect. The U.S. and the Soviets signed the ABM Treaty to avert a MIRV arms race, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicle race, in order to overcome missile defenses. 
This limited both states to two sites maximum and limited dedicated research for the interception of strategic systems. In other words, neither the U.S. or the Soviet Union could operate a large radar over their own territory. They could have a radar looking out of their territory, but not looking backward over their territory. The Soviets were accused several times uh, correctly of violating the ABM Treaty because they did build a radar that looked onto their own territory. The U.S. and the Soviets then adopted MIRV technology anyway. The U.S. cancellation of the treaty in 2002 was resisted by China and the Soviet Union and third state critics arguing that it would provoke an arms race, though it never happened, so the Americans were right. The picture below, you can see the fallout that would occur if the Chinese conducted a DF-5A intercontinental ballistic missile attack against the U.S. I was at the uh, BIMDO, the Ballistic Missile Defense Office, in 2002 at the Pentagon, where we did research on the impact of the cancellation of the treaty. The BIMDO is now the MDA, which is the Missile Defense Agency. In 1983, the U.S. government, led by U.S. President Ronald Reagan, proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative, also called Star Wars, which was a national missile defense system, or a shield to protect cities against missile attack. However, premature technology inhibited the effectiveness of the system. Research persisted around the 3 to $4 billion a year zone, which was about less than 1% of defense spending at the Pentagon, so it wasn't a major program. The 1991 Gulf War gave a further impetus to continued research because of the effects of scud attacks from Iraq on Saudi Arabia and Israel. Systems included an imagined series of nuclear-powered X-ray lasers that would detonate and use the power to focus the, the X-ray uh, lasers, orbiting mirrors that could refocus these rays both from, both from space and from the ground, nuclear-powered particle accelerators that would fire mesons and other uh, subatomic and superatomic uh, particles at objects, uh, and nuclear interceptors, uh, brilliant pebbles, which were these little drones that could be fired out of a cannon. Despite all of the investment, it was found that the technology was too immature for deployment. It was uh, not a waste of money, but it did not result in a space-based defense. In the picture here, you can see DF-3A, or CSS-2, uh, missiles on an exercise. So the current missile defense in the U.S. is organized by the Missile Defense Agency. The 1998 Rumsfeld Commission report indicated that there was a rapid rise in IRBMs, Intermediate Range Ballistic Missiles, and ICBM research in states hostile to the U.S., such as North Korea and Iran. Iran developed a Shahab-4 with a range of over 2,000 kilometers. The U.S. was not concerned that Iran would target the U.S., they were concerned that Iran would target Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Europe. North Korea continued to work on the Taipo Dong missile that could eventually reach the U.S. west coast, and probably does today. So the move was towards a broad-based, layered system involving mainly in conducting research and developments of that layered defense system. By 2008, you had 21 interceptors at Fort Greeley, Alaska, and six interceptors deployed at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And since then, uh, there's been a deployment to Gorshko, Poland, of the um, theater, missile, uh, theater missile, missile wide concept, which includes uh, 19 missiles at a site, and discussions for a radar at Brody in Czech, an X band radar. Here you can see uh, American missile defense spending until uh, 2019. You can see the number of uh, ballistic missile defense uh, rockets bought in uh, the different years. And you can see a picture of the American interceptor, which is deployed at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base and Fort Greeley. Now, the technology. There have been a very large number of systems proposals for missile defense, most of which have not been implemented. Uh, it is really one of the longest running research projects to shoot down missiles, and typically it's canceled because it's non-cost effective. Deterrence is much cheaper, much easier to blow up someone else's city than it is to shoot down a missile. And it comes down to the question of cost. Is it the ratio of the cost of the interceptor to the missile? Because if you build an interceptor, the enemy's just going to build uh, another missile. And it'll take you maybe three interceptors to shoot down one enemy missile. So they're forcing you to spend more money to protect your cities. But one missile is $2 million. The warhead is maybe $5 million. And the city is, in terms of annual activity, uh, probably worth $100 billion. But if you uh, count in the accumulated infrastructure built over the previous 200 years, a city is probably worth a trillion dollars. So maybe it does make sense. What are you willing to pay to protect a trillion dollar investment?
So, the technology. You have interceptor systems. These include a, the GBI, the ground-based interceptors. These are missile interceptors with multispectral sensors that can use exoatmospheric hit-to-kill technology. Uh, this is what the Americans have, the GBIs, based in Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base. They give coverage to all 50 American states. They don't have a nuclear warhead. They're able to approach and make contact with a high-velocity incoming rocket. Now, they prefer exoatmospheric interception where the missile is shorter ranged. A rocket fired from North Korea is going to have to go all the way over the um, uh, northern Pacific, which means over Alaska, and probably down the coast of Canada in order to hit the U.S., which will give... Um, uh, Alaska, um, sort of an easy perspective because the missile be, will be coming right at it. There are brilliant pebble satellites. These are satellites that use uh, acceleration and then they use hit-to-kill technology for exoatmospheric strikes. You had a big project on airborne lasers called ABLs. So you had a large 747 and it had a laser in the nose. It, these were used for endoatmospheric boost phase interception. In other words, when the enemy rocket was rising very slowly because of the plume of the rocket, they were visible. Uh, the Americans had a goal of seven aircraft by 2009 to 2012 at a cost of 11 billion. The laser technology worked poorly uh, from space into the Earth's atmosphere, so they calculated the laser had to operate within the Earth. The first test was conducted in 2008 but ultimately the program was cancelled after two aircraft became available. Although they could sort of work technically, the only real target um, that they could be deployed against would be rockets launched from North Korea, but then you need a very large aircraft package that could escort the 747 uh, close enough to North Korea off the coast to be able to intercept the rocket as it raised um, up in the atmosphere. And it just simply didn't seem like it was cost effective. You also have boost phase endoatmospheric interception. Uh, so here you've got uh, a geographic limit, uh, a limitation of around a thousand kilometers maximum because you have that much distance to cover which is the time it would take for an aircraft for a missile to launch into uh, outer space and become exoatmospheric. So an interceptor would have to accelerate for a hundred seconds and then cruise it eight kilometers a second in order to make the interception and that's normally the speed of a warhead coming into the atmosphere not uh, horizontally across the atmosphere. An intermediate range ballistic missile takes about 70 to 150 seconds of burning, where an ICBM takes about 200 seconds of burning. So you have three minutes. A liquid ICBM takes 250 to 300 seconds, but uh, China has a few of these left, but almost all countries are going towards solid fuel propellant. So you'd have to have a very fast interceptor to be able to catch a, a rocket in boost phase. One of the reasons why the uh, airborne laser was also canceled. This is the kill vehicle engine. So once the rocket interceptor gets close to the target, this thing comes out, it's got a little bit of propellant, it's already moving at very high velocity, and then it basically guides itself in. On top was the uh, early concept test bed for the airborne laser, and below is one of the two actual ABL Boeing 747-400Fs uh, that were built. Ultimately, not very successful. So these systems, uh, well, here you have actually the concept of how the airborne laser would shoot down a rocket in the boost phase over what is definitely not North Korea. Although it looks like that's a Soviet aircraft with canards. So I'm not sure what this picture is meant to represent. So surveillance. So the uh, beam use upgraded radars, of which there's five currently at uh, Clear Alaska, Beale Air Force Base in California, Cape Cod, Massachusetts, Thule, Greenland, and Filingdale, UK. Ground-based X-band radars uh, are to be built and have been built already in Shemia Aleutians. And there are additional sites in the Marshalls, uh, which are U.S. islands in the Pacific, South Korea, Hawaii, Shanki in Japan, and the Czech Republic. Now in terms of satellites, there are 24 Sibers Low satellites. The Sibbers Low is the picture that you see here on the right. It's a smaller satellite. It's an advanced space-based infrared system low earth orbit satellite. So they'll probably be shot down because they're low earth orbit. But what their role is as infrared system is to detect the uh, propellant plume uh, uh, pushing the rocket up to the atmosphere. And so they can track. Apparently it can also distinguish between decoys and real uh, warheads. I'm not sure how. It's got passive tracking and multi-sensor analysis. 
There are also six Cybrus High, which are advanced space-based infrared systems, or high Earth orbit surveillance satellites. Uh, they're going to replace the DSP satellites that are used currently for ballistic missile launch warning. The DSP satellite is the satellite you see in the bottom left. DSP stands for Defense Support Program Satellites. They were designed to defeat the FOBs, the Fractional Orbital Bombardment System, so they could detect uh, 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 orbiting warheads that are low Earth orbit coming from Antarctica uh, that did not have any propellant pume. Uh, these are the variable missile trajectories. You can see the SS-25, which is very high, and the SS-18, which is much lower. Obviously, the uh, lower trajectory is best because you can ev evade uh, the radar. Uh, I'm not sure why the SS-25 has such a horrible trajectory. It could be that they're going for a faster um, re-entry in the terminal phase. So this is a conception that you might have seen uh, before. We talked about this before, but uh, here's a distinction between the probability of tracking and the probability of the uh, interceptor kills. And here you see um, different interceptors required for different ratios and convergences. And so this is one of those um, elements that go into planning uh, layered uh, missile defense. So this is NORAD, which I visited in uh, 2002. You can see the blast doors. Those blast doors are not at the end of the tunnel, they're on the side of the tunnel. So if a shockwave went into the tunnel, it would just pop out the other side. And you can see, the, again, the command center on the uh, bottom right, and uh, you can see Canada there. And uh, although the U.S. has Air Force One and they show it flying around, Canada does have a really downgraded Canada Air Force One, which is more of a transport than a staffing airplane, uh, which we did fly on and it, it really doesn't have any command capacity, but the U.S. assumes we will have an aircraft like that, and so when they're running the exercise, they showed Canada's equivalent of aircraft flying around Canada, and we were, well, I guess we were flattered that they thought we had enough organizational skill to actually put our Prime Minister in an airplane. This is a uh, wideband radar in the Marshall Islands, which looks over the Pacific. Here you can see a uh, X-band radar uh, again in the uh, Marshall Islands and you can see the uh, two bases at uh, Beale in California and uh, Fort Greeley in Alaska. You can also again see Filingdales in the UK, uh, Thule uh, in uh, Greenland and uh, you can see the, uh, the location in Shemia Island at the end of the Aleutian Islands where there's a radar facility as well as Hawaii. The United States was much more politically divided in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, in the 1980s, because of the Cold War, you had a very strong uh, left movement uh, in the U.S. and they consistently questioned the scale of the defense budget. One of the focuses was on the waste of money. Now, a lot of this was, was uh, sort of exaggerated. Uh, you very often had committee disagreements because you had an enormous amount of scarcity in uh, how much money there was for the, for the uh, Department of, of DOD to spend at the Pentagon. And so people would fight and use any tactic they could to shift money from one program uh, to another. So it took on an ideological tone. But um, these are very expensive programs. So there were 19 tests for the uh, Peacekeeper missile, and uh, these were heavily criticized as being um, uh, not good tests. And there were 74 tests for the cruise missile. A lot of concern was voiced over the Patriot tests, of which there are 114. If you look on the right side, there's a picture of a failed Patriot test. And the Patriot was the main surf stair missile system and anti-missile system of the 1980s. And so uh, the criticism was that the system um, didn't work. So uh, this, is, it's, this is one of those um, aspects of domestic politics procurement in democracies. So theater missile defense. You recall from the very first lecture in the, in the course, we spoke about the distortion caused by Saddam Hussein's successful strike of the uh, barracks at Dharan, which killed uh, a large number of American uh, Air Force personnel, which led the Americans to disproportionately focus spending on theater missile defense. So this is what we're going to look at now. So theater missile defense was driven by a combination of emerging technology and apparent missile threats. The U.S. wanted to be able to deploy into different parts of the world and not have local countries fire rockets, even if they were not nuclear, at vulnerable locations the U.S. used for embarkation or debarkation, like port facilities and air bases. 
So uh, the Americans uh, had uh, four battalions, uh, which include 483 uh, Patriot Pack 2s. These are fragmentation warheads, and they have Pack 3s, which are hit to kill technology. The Americans have also successfully deployed the Theater uh, High Altitude Area Defense, the THAAD. Uh, and this took 20 years to develop, but it's basically a very long-range missile with the latest technology meant to shoot down a variety of missiles and also high-altitude, very, very distant aircraft. And uh, THAAD has been deployed in Poland and Europe, uh, primarily against the Soviet um, parent threat to the Baltic states. Another 20-year-old program is Navy Theater Wide. Uh, there was an attempt to spread the, the technology to shoot down missiles. Now in the ABM treaty, it was not permitted for um, surface to air missiles to shoot down uh, ballistic missiles. So it was one of the motives for canceling the ABM treaty. So it was, uh, experiments were conducted on Aegis equipped cruisers and destroyers of which the US had 74 to use their native radar system and take the standard M3 missile, which is meant to shoot down airplanes. It's not a particularly high tech missile. Uh, it doesn't have a particularly good speed but uh, it was decided to see if they could adapt the uh, interceptor system uh, using the radar and this missile and it turned out that it, there was some great success and the SM-3 achieved a hit to kill against a space target on November 2007 and this technology has now been deployed to all 74 ships uh, typically the uh, Aegis class cruisers and a number of destroyers like the Early Burke so this has given the U.S. a tremendous capacity. So if, say, Taiwan were the subject of a large-scale um, uh, missile attack, which, which is likely, the Chinese have deployed a large number of conventional missiles to shut down Taiwan's air bases, the U.S. could deploy several ships off the coast of Taiwan and then try to shoot down those missiles without having to do the much more difficult process of landing Patriot batteries uh, by aircraft or ship into Taiwan. So the ships are, uh, in some sense, much more mobile and uh, it's not visible. Uh, they're, 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 it, can't, it can't be sabotaged by commando teams because the, the ships will be off uh, to sea. So you can see there at the bottom um, assorted different Patriot launches. Here's a, a Patriot launcher. Here's another Patriot launch. During the uh, war uh, in 1991 where the US attacked Iraq in order to liberate Kuwait, there's a lot of criticism by a security expert who specializes in missile technology called Theodore Postal at MIT. And he challenged, looking at pictures and the resulting data, the claim that the US was shooting down almost all of the Soviet Scuds, or uh, rather the Iraqi Scuds uh, that the Iraqis had bought from the Soviet Union. It, it turned out that uh, Theodore Postal was right. A lot of the Patriots were, were hitting nearby, but not actually altering the ballistic path of the Scud so that the Scud warheads were not actually detonating. And some of these Scuds would then land on the ground regardless. Um, they, it wasn't elegant. They weren't landing as a rocket. They were landing in pieces, but they were nevertheless landing and detonating. So this is the uh, Soviet SA-12 theater missile defense system. It's actually a system that goes back uh, to the 80s. The Soviets uh, never had much confidence in their ability to win an air war using their own aircraft. So uh, instead, they focused on using um, these types of surface-to-air missile systems right from the beginning of the Cold War in the 1950s to both protect their interior, because the US was frequently flying U-2 reconnaissance aircraft over the Soviet Union, until in 1962 they shot down uh, Gary Powers, who was flying a U-2, and they put him on trial, and eventually he was exchanged for a spy that the Americans had captured. Um, so uh, the Soviets continued to deploy these with their ground forces, where the Americans generally provide air cover uh, and missile cover using their aircraft. Uh, the Russians continue to use these systems uh, in order to protect their land forces if they were to attack. So the SA-12 evolved in the post-Cold War period into the S-300V, and they were designed to shoot down tactical missiles like the Pershing-2, which had a very um, a low arc. So it didn't have a, a high arc, so it was, it was difficult to see. It would fly very low over the ground. Uh, the S-300 has since been evolved into the S-400. This here is the S-400, and of course the rocket there looks very similar to the uh, US Sprint. I would never accuse the Soviet Union of stealing, even though the Aleutian May aircraft looks exactly like the, um, uh, the uh, American uh, P-3 Orion and their Sukhoi-24 looks like a ripoff of the uh, FB-1 
111, um, notwithstanding uh, uh, repeated Soviet copying of Western technology, um, it, it's, it's possible that there's just a, a common point of convergence for certain kinds of technology, so they end up looking the same. This is a, from a, an article in the 1980s, a very long time ago, where the U.S. was trying to show off the benefits of Navy theater-wide from a political standpoint. The big issue today are hypersonic weapons because they come in so quickly, it'll make it very difficult for surface to air missiles to intercept them. Um, I'm on the skeptical end where I think they're so fast that uh, they're not going to maneuver. And if they don't maneuver, they can be damaged by fragmentation devices. Because if you fly a hypersonic vehicle through a pile of pellets, it's going to disintegrate. But um, a lot of the publications disagree with me. Um, but it's possible that organizations want to uh, exaggerate the threat because they want the system uh, to lead to funding of their their defensive defensive systems. The other issue is just general deterrence. Is is a missile that flies ten times the speed of sound going to make absolutely any difference in nuclear deterrence? Uh, do you want to you know whether you nuke them in five minutes or nuke them the day after tomorrow? They're still going to suffer retaliation. So I could see the tactical purpose of these devices but a nuclear version doesn't seem politically logical to me. So certainly something to write a paper about and try to see what the implications are from a deterrent standpoint. There are already publications out there about this. So let's take a look at the um, theater missile systems of other countries. Well, Italy um, was actually the victim of a missile attack. After the U.S. bombed Libya in 1986 with F-111s, losing one aircraft, and killed the adopted daughter of Muammar Gaddafi, the Libyan leader, um, Libya retaliated. They fired two Scud missiles at Lampedusa, which is a small Italian island in the Mediterranean near Malta. Uh, NATO at the time didn't notice, um, but within uh, several weeks they did figure out that that's what it was. The Scuds got nowhere near Lampedusa Island, and that's the reason why Italy didn't realize that um, they were being targeted. But Italy, as a part of many other countries in NATO, had a long-term interest in missile defense because they already had the Nike Hercules system, which could have been adapted for that purpose. So there were many NATO projects uh, focused on missile defense, not at a very high level of funding, because although there was a latent threat of missile attack, you had missiles in, in Libya, uh, in uh, Egypt, in Syria, and you had Iran developing a long-range missile. Despite that, um, those countries were not uh, ever vocally discussing firing a missile at a European capital. So it wasn't really politically salient. So NATO had a long-term joint project called the Active Layered Theater Missile Ballistic Missile System, um, which was supposed to be deployed by 2010. Um, most of the time these states do research on those systems and they, they borrow aspects of it, like the uh, radar systems and the coordination centers and the data systems. But uh, they, they very often just buy American systems and then they insert them into that larger architecture. So Netherlands got uh, four Pac-3 batteries of 136 missiles. Germany's got uh, 28 launchers with six, rather 28 missiles with six Pac-3 launchers. Italy's got three Nike Hercules batteries. Uh, Turkey's got 92 Nike Hercules systems. The British have their own version of a Navy Theater Y, which they've deployed so far on one destroyer. A Type 45. Here you can see the Aegis Ashore, which is uh, an aspect of the Navy Theater Y that's actually been deployed uh, in Poland. It's already there, as well as uh, plans to do the same in uh, Romania. Israel had um, a joint support funding from the U.S. to deploy two and now three Arrow 2 batteries uh, for missile defense. The first uh, system is uh, deployed at uh, Palmakim base um, in 2000 uh, near Tel Aviv and near the city of Hadera in 2002. And these are designed to shoot down scud-like rockets, particularly chemical weapons or radiological weapons or nuclear weapons. A third battery is formed and the study would be uh, deployed near uh, Haifa. These have a range of 10 to 40 kilometers um, uh, and uh, yeah, so Israel also has uh, three Pac-2s and five Pac-3 uh, batteries. These are the American systems, they're Patriots. Uh, U.S. and Israel worked on a Moab unmanned aerial vehicle carried interceptor, which had a speed of 1.4 kilometers a second, but this was really a research project. It was not deployed. Uh, 
There was work on a SkyGuard Thel, which is a tactical high energy laser, of which 30% uh, of the funding was from Israel and 70% the US. It cost about $100 million a year. It was cancelled in 2001. I restarted in uh, 2006. It's a very political issue. It has to do with, you know, whether the Israel is getting Zionist support in the legislature and whether those people have uh, influence over the procurement at the Pentagon. Um, so with this uh, uh, tactical laser, um, I, I've not heard it ever being deployed. But the knowledge is then applied to tactical lasers being deployed on ships now in order to shoot down drones cost effectively because it doesn't make sense to fire a giant missile at a small drone. So it was estimated that uh, each shot of the laser would be about two to three thousand uh, dollars. In March seventh, the uh, U.S. and Israelis conducted a joint ballistic missile defense exercise called uh, Juniper uh, Cobra. The Americans have a crew with a radar base deployed in Israel, and your question as to how that radar is also integrated into the Israeli system. So, I mean, we we could expect that the Israelis and Americans actually have a data stream and they're actually sharing all of each other's radar information with regard to missile interception. The Israelis have a number of other systems that are fairly controversial. Uh, obviously, Israel lives in a, um, uh, a challenging environment where they're constantly having rockets fired at their citizens. And so they've developed a range of rocket interceptor systems from very small to very large. There are, however, very big questions about cost effectiveness and whether they work, in fact, and whether uh, they're not just a part of a propaganda system to try to convince um, bomb and missile makers like those in the Gaza that it's not worthwhile to fire the rockets in the first place. So far, it hasn't happened. Um, uh, Lebanon had a war with Israel, and Israel basically ran out of ordinance and had to call it quits, and they never were never successful in suppressing rocket launches because rocket launches over the undulating uh, distribution of terrestrial train is extremely difficult. In fact, there was only ever one single aerial interception of a ground-based rocket, and that was in the Second World War, and it was actually not a success, but a close call, where the British almost blew up a V-2 mobile launching site. So the Israelis have an iron cap facility. It's a point defense system. It costs about $35,000 an interceptor, and it's for short-range rockets. Again, um, the short-range rockets are, are uh, much cheaper, like the Katusha rockets, that are uh, basically Soviet-designed, uh, manufactured now in the Middle East because the Soviets exported so many, and reproduced in Gaza. For, the, for the, those in the Gaza and Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, it's typically with the help of the Iranians. The Israelis also have Steel Curtain, which is good against uh, uh, missiles that have ranges of between three and 150 miles, and they cost $100,000 an interceptor. There's also David's Sling Stunner, which can be used against targets of between 24 and 150 miles, and that costs $300,000 an interceptor. And there's the Iron Dome, uh, which costs about $100,000 per interceptor, and it's short range, and it's been found to be ineffective against the Qassam rockets that were fired out of Gaza. This is the uh, Prithvi. Originally, uh, India used this as their first uh, nuclear warhead uh, launch rocket, but it's subsequently been adapted as an air defense missile with a nuclear warhead, and uh, it's uh, therefore an ABM uh, system as well. Uh, India completed the first test of this interception system on November 27, 2006. On December 2, 2007, it did an, an interception hit without a nuclear warhead over the Bay of Bengal. So uh, it does seem that uh, India has the technology for ABMs. Now this here is a depiction of a uh, Chinese uh, interceptor. China currently has 850 uh, S-300s, Soviet uh, equivalent um, air defense systems. Uh, they also have a PLA Dongning-2 ASAT, which can be used for uh, missile interception. And it did conduct a May 2013 high orbit, but we don't know how high orbit the uh, interception was. Japan, since uh, for the last 20 years, since August of 1998, when the, the North Koreans fired a missile over Japan, uh, have mobilized their resources for missile defense. They have a joint missile defense research program with the US, which includes a Navy theater-wide program of several hundred million dollars for several years. They have a joint interception radar, which they share with the US in Japan, as well as with the US Navy since 2007. They possess 18 batteries of Pac-3, which they've occasionally deployed in downtown Tokyo. And like the U.S. Navy, they've adapted their Atago and their Kongu Aegis destroyers, which are um, very large and very 
uh, almost cruiser-sized uh, destroyers, they've all been adapted to Navy theater-wide. So Japan has that same mobile uh, uh, ship-based uh, capacity to intercept missiles. South Korea has um, a U.S. Patriot battalion, but they prefer their retaliatory capability. They have a missile that they've uh, developed that's in violation of the missile technology control regime, but the U.S. forgives them because they're a close ally. So South Korea would prefer to drop bombs on North Korea than intercept incoming rockets. Uh, the South Koreans have also uh, equipped one of their KDX-3 destroyers with Navy theater wide. So uh, South Korea, like Japan, is moving in the high technology uh, direction. Uh, Taiwan has uh, 25 Patriot launchers, uh, plus they have the indigenous uh, Tian Kung 3 uh, ABM, which is meant to shoot down um, one of the hundreds of missiles that uh, China's got targeted at Taiwan to neutralize Taiwanese air bases in the opening phases of an attack on Taiwan. Obviously, Taiwan wants a higher profile joint TMD systems with the U.S., which the U.S. is currently avoiding. And Taiwan also prefers deterrence to uh, theater missile defense. They're also in violation of the missile technology control regime by acquiring the technology to fire rockets at cities in China like Shanghai. So Taiwan would prefer to retaliate um, than uh, uh, conduct uh, interception. So what are some of the issues with missile defense? Well, one, the U.S. invests in ballistic missile interceptors because it fears that local nuclear weapons may either effectively deter local states from providing bases or may actually simply destroy the bases. Uh, for example, for the U.S. To, to deploy into South Korea in a war, they'd have to go through the base of Busan in the south. And if North Korea were to nuke the base, it would uh, make it more problematic. The U.S. would have to go to smaller bases in other parts of the South Korean littoral. Or if the U.S. wanted to land in Taiwan or use, say, Mazira Island in Oman to go into the Persian Gulf, um, the, US, the U.S. being a distant maritime power needs to be able to get access through bases that are vulnerable in particular regions. At the bottom here, you can see a Nike Ajax base. So the second issue is that uh, U.S. missile defense is dependent on the radar facilities of regional allies in Filingdales, England, relay stations in Australia, Danish facilities at Thule in Greenland, Turkey, and, and other facilities in South Korea, the Czech Republic, Israel. So there are some dilemmas. The first one is the U.S. will be pressured uh, by allies to extend protection to these states as they will face a, a similar threat. And the U.S. may be chain-ganged into a local war if the local facilities are attacked, especially if the local facilities are dual-use, meaning they, they provide both local defense and missile defense for uh, global purposes. I'm not so sure that's really a big deal because most of the countries where the U.S. has bases deployed are fellow democracies that are quite restrained. There's no country that Israel would attack that isn't also a threat to the U.S., South Korea is very unlikely to attack North Korea, and Poland is not likely to provoke a border war with Russia. So since uh, 1940, the U.S. has spent $311 billion on missile defense. You can see uh, U.S. coastal Nike Hercules. Uh, the, the rather grainy picture on the right is uh, Fort Greeley, Alaska, and the Americans are deploying a GBI into its silo. So here you can see uh, 371 billion for strategic air defenses to shoot down bombers, 100 billion dollars for ballistic missile defense, 7 billion for anti-satellite weapons, uh, half a billion for nuclear emergency search teams. I guess that's for when you lose nuclear bombs. Uh, strategic anti-submarine warfare, which is a lot of money, basically chasing submarines and underground, uh, rather underwater microphones. Uh, 19.5 billion on civil defense, uh, 211 on overhead defense. That's against um, local missiles and air and overhead, which is, again, paying for, um, well, in this case, ASW, anti-submarine warfare, maintenance of helicopters, and that sort of thing.